Welcome everyone to another show. Today we welcome Steve Hoffman. Now, Steve, I'm going to run through your short bio, but your bio is massive. Um, so I really recommend you everyone connect with Steve. And Steve, I hope you don't mind that because I think as you read through your bio, it's nothing short of exceptional. Uh, and I read through a lot of bios, but when you get super excited about something you and I could possibly talk about for five hours, um, we're going to try and condense it into a short 20, 30 minutes. So there's definitely more to what I'm about to share with you. So Steve Hoffman, Captain Hoff, which Steve shared with me, is his gaming handle. Um, and there's a bit of gaming experience in what Steve has done in the past as well, uh, is the chairman and CEO of Founders Space, a global innovation hub of entrepreneurs, corporations and investors with over 50 partners in 22 countries. Hoffman is also a venture investor, founder of three venture-backed and two bootstrap startups, and author of several award-winning books. And there's some of those books that are actually sitting behind Steve right there. They include Make Elephants Fly, Surviving a Startup, and The Five Forces. Firstly, Steve, welcome, and thank you very much for joining us. Martin, it's fantastic to be here. Yeah, and, and Steve, Steve and I were talking before the show, and there's a lot that we can cover, but we've really condensed it into two primary areas because Steve has a lot of experience, not only starting technology companies and also being involved in broader productions of technology companies and also even in the entertainment and gaming industry as well. And so, Steve, what we're going to start with, two areas we're really going to focus a lot on is early stage companies, right, and, and really get your vibe on what, what it takes uh, to, to build a sustainable and successful companies. And the other one too, I'm really excited to touch on later is market trends and what you're excited about and what you think is, is in the space of technology and what's going to look forward, what you're looking forward to in the future. So, so with that, let's start with early stage. What's some of your early advice to founders and companies to actually get started and start to build their journey? Well, I have a lot of advice, <laughs> so much. I, I've done three venture funded startups and two bootstrap startups. So I know what that's like. Mm -hmm. I run Founderspace, the global startup accelerator, worked with so many entrepreneurs, see where they fail and where they succeed. And I will tell you, the, if you are starting a company, the first thing you should do, the first thing is don't worry about the idea. Now, most people are like, what are you talking about? You know, I'm starting yeah, a company. Yeah. I can't even start without an idea. Yeah. That is a myth. Yeah. In fact, most successful startups end up changing their idea along the way. So yeah. what they started with is actually just a starting point. Yeah. And this is why it's so important, because you don't know what you don't know when you start a startup. If it's really a new idea, you're breaking through, nobody has done it before in the way you're doing it, yeah. then what you don't know is whether it will work or not, because yeah. it hasn't been done. Yeah. So that's why I tell entrepreneurs, look, come up with 20 ideas, but come up with them, not just scatter shot all over the place, pick an area that you're really, really interested on in innovating. Mm. So let's say I want to transform the food industry, like, and I have all, all these different ideas. Well, you're not in the food industry, probably. You'll, most of the best entrepreneurs come from outside the industry. Yeah. The people inside seldom innovate. They're too busy just doing their jobs. Yeah. So they come from the outside. And when you come from the outside, you want to have a completely open mind. Because even if you have 20 ideas on how to innovate the food industry, you may be missing the big one. Like, because yeah. So whether you want to uh, revolutionize farming, change the fishing industry, whatever it is, pick an area, come up with a lot of ideas. And then the next thing you do, you don't start building anything. You don't start raising capital. Uh, you don't even start trying to get customers. The yeah. next thing you do is you go out and find amazing people who, when you come up with that right idea, can execute on that idea. Mm -hmm. People who really have talents that you lack. A technologist, if you need a technologist, a designer, a great designer, if you need a designer, somebody who's really good at marketing, the key people that you need, get them together at the beginning. It's so much better yeah. because first of all, then they have ownership, like they're a co-founder, they're in it with you. Uh, usually you don't have a lot of money, so you're not going to pay them. What you want to give them is not just equity ownership, but mental ownership. We're going on this journey together. We're going to discover what the market needs. And we're going to build that and bring it to market. So uh, 
That is the first step I recommend. And I will tell you, if you think you have to have a great idea before you start, I just want to give you a few examples of companies. And I write about these in my book, yeah. uh, companies that didn't have a great idea when they started. Well, one of them is YouTube. Like yeah. everybody thinks, oh, YouTube, those guys, you know, I know those guys and I've talked to them. You think that they thought they were going to build the largest broadcast video network in the world. Well, no. When they started, they were building a video dating site. Yeah, right. and it was <laughs> yeah, there you go. failing miserably. Yeah. It wasn't until they actually were failing and then they wanted to share a video with their friends. And yeah. they said, oh, what if we upload it to this video dating site and just share the link? Light bulb Boom. moment. Boom. Yeah. Google. Like we all think Google knew what they were doing from the beginning. They didn't. The founders of Google thought they were doing a nonprofit, nonprofit, which is ironic, given that they are one of the most prof profitable co yeah. companies in the history of humankind. Uh, but they were actually helping academics find research papers online. That's a super niche market. And no wonder they thought, and they were early in the internet. No wonder they thought it was an, a nonprofit. It was only later when they pivoted into general search, taking the technology they had, that they saw the big opportunity. Yeah. And the list goes on and on. Slack. Yeah. Slack. Remember, right. That was the one I was thinking of. Slack. Yeah, they, yeah. they were building a game. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> and, and the game was failing. Yeah. And they looked and they, all their engineers had hacked together this communications tool that they were using to collaborate more effectively. And they're like, well, the game isn't working. Let's try this. <laughs> so, so that just shows you. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. So the because it's very, it's very easy to get caught up on something. Oh, yeah. Isn't that's it? why I say come up with 20 ideas so that you don't yeah. have that emotional investment. As soon as you attach your ego yeah. to one idea, yeah. very hard to let it go. Yeah. If you, and that's where most startups die. Not yeah. because they change too often, because they stick with an idea that isn't working too long. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting because that also leads to a discussion around a type of founder. Right, because for a founder to be so fixated on, on one thing and they can just be so, you know, let's call the word pig-headed, right? And they go, well, that's that. But they've surrounded now themselves with a bunch of people who are going, you know what, maybe this isn't quite it. Maybe it's over here where some founders might go, well, that's not what I'm doing. I'm doing this as opposed to they're going, actually, that looks like a great idea. So yeah, it, it happens all the time. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times the great ideas are right in front of you, but because you're so fixated on doing yeah. this one thing in a lot of it is that founders think if I give up on my initial idea, I'm failing. Like, yeah. and, and the more time they put in it to it, the more money they put into it, the less likely they are to change, even though it's more obvious it isn't working. Yeah. So you, yes, you always have to challenge yourself. This is how you succeed. You don't yeah. exceed like some of the best founders in the world didn't come up with their great ideas at all. They weren't even their ideas. That's what you've just got to disassociate yourself with. Like Elon Musk didn't start Tesla. It yeah. wasn't his. He was just an early investor. Kalanick didn't start Uber. He was just an early investor. The list goes on and on. Yeah. It doesn't have to be your idea. With yeah. Great entrepreneurs, this is what my definition of a great entrepreneur. Great entrepreneurs aren't people who come up with great ideas. Those are inventors. Like those, you know, they're inventors and they're lucky people who stumble on them. But really great entrepreneurs who are consistently great are what I call demand hunters. Right. They, they aren't after an idea. They are out looking in the marketplace for pockets of pent up demand. That means mm. the world is always changing. Demand is all new pockets of demand are always forming. And this is where entrepreneurs actually take off. They identify, oh, there's this group of people and they, they really could do something because of the new technology or new way of thinking about it, new design, yeah. innovation. They could, we could do it so much better for them. Like yeah. we could make a product or a service that's just not incrementally better than what's out there, but exponentially. Yes. Or something that's just different that they couldn't do before that they can do now. Do now and, then, yeah. and then what you do is you test the demand. Like, yeah. is there enough demand out there? And I'm not talking, you know, a lot of people, how do I know if my idea works? Like, I get this question all the time. Like, how do yeah. and I go? If you go up to somebody, let's say you, I tell entrepreneurs, go talk to a hundred potential customers. If you go talk to a hundred customers and all of those customers come back to you and say, I like it. You know, that's an interesting idea. Come back later when it's done and show it to me. Yeah. If they all say that you are dead in the water. 
Yeah. You have, <laughs> you are totally dead. You ha- are going to fail. I can guarantee it. Yeah. 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 Because that means there's no real, de- anybody's going to say, yeah, that's nice. Come back later. Anybody like th- that's the standard response. You know, when you have demand, like real demand is when they say this, oh my God, you, you can do that. You could, can I get that today? How can I get it? Can I sign on? We, we've been waiting for that. Tell me. Yeah. <laughs> You get that reaction, then you've got something. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I, and I, I love the energy behind it because these are these are real ex- live experiences that you've seen, you've gone through yourself. Oh yeah, and I've yeah. made these mistakes. Of, yeah, of, yeah, yeah. I've had I've gone out to a hundred customers, and when they all said they liked it, I believed them. Yeah. <laughs> And I well, built the it, damn it, thing and nobody wanted it. Yeah. And, that's, and, and, and it's, it's really to a point as well, because we keep on coming back to this. And this is the hardest thing. You know, I, I hear even, you know, um, my, uh, my younger family generation are going, I want to be an entrepreneur. It's really the first time they wanted to define themselves as something. I remember my generation, it was, hey, I want to go into the workforce and I'll either be very fixated on something or I'm going to find my way and I'll, I'll get there. But they're being really specific about this word entrepreneur. I want yes, to be yes. an entrepreneur. And it's great, but I think what we all don't understand is you nearly have to fail more, right, every if single day. If you're going to break it through... It. It, it, it is a process of failure, <laughs> repeated yeah. failure. This is why I entitled my book, Surviving a Startup, yeah. because most startups don't survive. Yes. Yeah. And if you're going to survive, you have to be prepared to fail many times. Mm. And then it's really important to learn from others. Like really smart entrepreneurs are always asking questions, yeah. always asking questions of themselves, yeah. of their team, of advisors, of customers. They're like, just because they know. I'm going to hit so many dead ends. And the only way around those dead ends is to keep asking, get more and more and better information. Yeah, that's awesome. And it's an incredibly humbling experience. Startup. Yes. Yeah. And so oh, it is. <laughs> so I, it I wanna, is. Yeah, I want to ask you, so, so the, the idea, that's awesome, because I, I, I went to the same companies that you were thinking of, which was Slack and even the Elon Musk story and, and things like that. You talked about mental ownership. And that really did hit a chord with me. And do you think that this is what today requires is the mental ownership? Or do you think it's actually been there for a while? We just, I've never heard it described as mental ownership before because typically it is equity, right? It's a, it's a particular, the idea of what's going to happen and how we're all going to get rewarded for it. But the mental uh, equity. Yeah, I, mental think, I think it's really, really important Look, if you're going to get somebody to quit their six-figure job that's comfortable, steady, they have probably they're getting stock options and other things if they're in the tech industry, and the compensation rates are like through the moon, you know, through the roof, all the way to the moon now, how are you going to, you can't match them. Like, they've got to be insane to join your startup (laughs) at an early, early stage, I'm talking, when it's just an idea, because they're giving up a lot, and they're probably, it's probably going to result in nothing, but People don't make all their decisions based on strict financial rules. Mm -hmm. They make their decisions because we're emotional beings. You have to tap into what a person wants to achieve with their life. Who that they, like you said it before, you said people see themselves as an entrepreneur. Being an entrepreneur is not just starting a business and making money. Being an entrepreneur is I want to do something great with my life. I Mm. want to make a real difference. I want to make change. I want to build something out of nothing. That's what it is. That's why getting them to own, become a partner owner mentally, not Mm. on paper, but it's much important mentally of your business allows them to live that dream with you yes. and nothing mo- motivates people more than internal motivation yeah. you know, compensation is external right that's something that they're going to get and receive at some future point in time but the internal drive is what's probably driving you if you're an entrepreneur yeah. because if you were sensible and you had the skill uh, a lot of skills you'd get a great job yeah. it's probably driving you and it's going to drive your team yeah no i love this i love, I love this comp- you're suiting me right now by the way <laughs> Thank you. It's my even job. At my, even at my tender age, I continue <laughs> to learn and get energized uh, by individuals like yourself. So thank you very much. 
Let's talk about market trends. I am going to ask you an investor question probably after this as well of what you look for, but we may even get it out of this question. So let's talk about market trends. What, what, what are you seeing as in the, no, no, well, however you want to, you know, clarify the next big thing or the exciting side of technology, where do you think it's going and what do you think is going to win? Well, I'll tell you, first of all, there's never, ever in the history of humankind been a better time to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Their innovation is accelerating. There are more new technologies, more new ideas, more new ways to collaborate with open source emerging every single day than there ever has been before. Like, it's absolutely amazing. And each one of these uh, are, are potentially game-changing, industry-changing mm -hmm. technologies. So, and they have so many applications. Like, think about the AI or the blockchain or any of these technologies, robotics. How It's, it's infinite, the number of applications you, you could apply them to. Yeah. So all of these create opportunities for entrepreneurs. And all of these, like as an investor. So I'm in the Silicon Valley region, and yeah. I... Uh, work with hundreds of startups, and I'm looking at what they're working on. And I'll tell you in the near term, mid term, and long term what I'm really excited about. Yeah. So near term, like if I want a really good, solid investment, that kind of like it's kind of a no brainer. Mm -hmm. I love SaaS based startups. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you know any B two B startup. First of all, I can call up the customer. I can yeah. see if that demand is there. I can literally look and see, you know, and estimate very simply how many customers are out there. So if they have a, like an, an amazing solution to a problem all these companies are having, and SaaS is great because I love recurring revenue. Like mm -hmm. I want a company that doesn't just make money once and the customer disappears. It's yeah. a really hard business model. Yeah. I want a company that's going to get money over and over and over. That's how you scale a business. So yeah. software king like software because it's low it's it, it, you can do so many things with software and, yeah. and and the cost to build it and the time to build it is so much less than hardware or other yeah. things that i i'm big into that yeah right. but you know there are other areas that are super exciting right now the space industry like look at it it's like a whole <laughs> ecosystem of its own yeah. um and i'm not talking you're you know the chance of you being the next billionaire rocket boy, you know, like Elon Musk yeah. or Branson or Bezos, like, you know, you're not going to do that, like, yeah. and compete with those guys. But what you can do is there's all these niches for hardware and software in that world. There's a whole ecosystem. They're going to need stuff. They can't build it all themselves. Yeah. You can get into that. Um, there are other areas that are super exciting. So I'm big into CRISPR gene editing technology. I literally... It, we have uncovered the source code for life. So you imagine we, we invented computer code and it yes. revolutionized yep. everything, right? Yep. Well, we are doing what we've done for the internet and iPhones and technology for biology now, yeah. right? We can create new species of plants and animals that never existed. And do you know how much it costs to get a gene editing kit? Like you can get a basic gene editing kit for a hundred bucks. Yeah, it's well. like unbelievably cheap. Yeah. So just yeah. like software, all it takes is the knowledge to yes, the people yeah. to actually execute on it. So yeah. there's so many potentials for like every disease we've ever had, for every crop out there, we're going to need to, it's going to need to be gene edited for climate change, just for creating new foods and plants. Yeah. And people are mixing like berries and bananas together, the genes and get a berry banana, a banana that tastes like a berry. You know, it's like, Th these are you're, you're painting a picture like, and being in the background of entertainment, part of your, your career as well, mm -hmm. is these futuristic movies that we're seeing. Which we always They're coming do. to life. We're this is happening. You know, I was in Chile talking to one of the largest fruit companies, and they have they're doing gene editing, yeah. uh, and they're creating. They're experimenting with how can we create fruits that don't bruise as easily? Amazing. How can we create fruits yeah. that we can ship to America? Yeah. You know, without rotting. How can we create fruits of new flavors and all the you know? So yeah. these people are doing this right now, and yeah. and these are these are we're just scratching the surface. Then yeah. you get into robotics. Now, robotics is hard. It's always harder when you combine hardware and software. It's like two startups in one. So you have a software startup, be thankful. Like <laughs> It's easy. <laughs> but, but uh, the, you know, literally, we are going to see robots uh, doing all, all sorts of jobs that were never possible before. Yes. New advances in machine learning, uh, deep learning technologies. It's going to be transformative. And if you look like I'm in the United States right now, we have a shortage 
of labor, a critical shortage of labor in, in, in areas like the food and service industries. There just mm-hmm. aren't enough people to, to, that want to work in the restaurants, yeah. the fields and farmers. You know, people don't want to pick the crops. It's brutal work, like out in the hot yeah. sun. Robots are going to have to step in. Elderly care, nations like Japan and China, the populations are aging, massive populations. They don't have enough young people to even take care of all these old people. Yeah. Robots are going to have to fill the gap. The demand is going to be extreme. When there's extreme demand, yeah. big opportunities for entrepreneurs. Yeah. And let me wrap it up with one more that's yep. really cool. Yep. You've probably heard of this, brain-computer interfaces. So Elon Musk and others are, are developing chips now. Mm -hmm. Uh, that you can literally insert into the brain that at some point, and they can actually do this now, they've done it in the lab. You can actually think thoughts in your head and communicate them directly to the internet, directly to the cloud. (laughs) I was hoping we would stick to our mobile phones being able to do that for us. So we can yep. actually guide it. Guide it's it. coming. But, you know, most of us will not want to get chips in our head unless yep. we are like severely paralyzed, like our entire yeah. body. But yeah. what they are also developing, the U.S. military and DARPA is putting And Remember, they invented the Internet. They are developing the technology now for non-evasive, mean no drilling holes in your head, yeah. brain computer interfaces. You can just wear them like a headband and you can uh, up and upload and download data from your brain. When that happens, we won't need a cell phone. iOS and Android will seem like those ancient compute punch cards. (laughs) iOS and Android will become punch cards and we will literally have a brain operating system that interfaces between our thoughts and everything else out there. Well, this is interesting because even the way our children are learning right now, I say to my kids, they they ask me questions and dare I say I'm a parent and I sit down with them and we work through some things. But I also say Google is your best friend, right? That's because what, that's that's what I, I told my kids. I was like, mm. you know, I can help you, but <laughs> I'm, yeah. I may be wrong. Just go online. There's Khan Academy. There's Google. There's every right. single thing you need to learn is on the internet. In the fact, same, yeah. honestly, if you get a kid so that they can read, write, and do basic arithmetic, they can learn everything. They could quit school <laughs> and learn everything else online. I've got I've got a yeah, very good friend of mine. Actually, was uh, on a previous series that we ran, and uh, you know, I call him the Matrix, the Human Matrix, because you can basically just data download into this individual, and all of a sudden he's he's driving, he's right, um, flying planes. All of a sudden, yeah. and I go to the Matrix model because it was, that was less that was very invasive, right? The way that they did it through the through the back, but the idea of how do you upload? you know, things. And, it, and that also goes back to the entrepreneur side of who we are as individuals. Um, yes. and, and again, I, I would love your thoughts on if, if I was starting out as a, as a young entrepreneur, because I, I also believe it's not for everybody, right? As, as, as glorious as it sounds and all the people we've talked about, they've got amazing stories, success stories. As you rightfully said, the majority, the mass majority fail. Yes. And comes with that is stress, is mental health, is physical health, is, you know, friendships and, and everything that goes with it as well. So what's your advice for a young entrepreneur? And by the way, I would classify myself as an aspiring entrepreneur through the first two decades of my career, but I'm a young entrepreneur in my third, right? I, 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 always, I was always entrepreneur. I could see, I can go back and say, actually, you were already there. You just hadn't worked out what it was yet. And now I've worked out what it is. And now I'm going on that journey. And it's hard. It's not easy. It's really brutal. Yeah. And so what's some of your advice? My advice is a couple of things. So number one, it's going to be stressful. There is no way around it. Some people handle stress better than others. Mm. So if you don't handle stress well, you have to work on yourself. You have to work on, otherwise it's going to be torture. Like you're going to torture yourself. So you have to be comfortable with the ups and downs of being an entrepreneur. You have to be comfortable with uncertainty. Like you never know what's coming next. Um, You have to be comfortable with financial risk because Mm -hmm. it's a huge financial risk. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the most important thing to surviving a startup, which is the book I wrote, is not just making your business survive, but like you said, making those relationships around you survive. Is it worth it to have a successful business and lose your marriage, Mm -hmm. uh, not spend enough time with your kids and regret that when you're older because you don't really know them because you're spending all your time working, lose your best friends because you're just totally out of touch and you never respond to them? No, the answer is no. 
So uh, the, you can solve this in a couple of ways. One, block out time for them. Like literally, just like you would schedule meetings that you wouldn't miss, you have to schedule time for your friends and family. And like, oh, every week I'm going to spend this time with my friends and family come hell or high water. Like mm-hmm. I'm not going to compromise on it. And you do that, right? Yeah. Number two, communication. Like most marriages break down, most relationships break down because the, the, the couples don't, they, they aren't communicating in the same way. Mm-hmm. So you really mm-hmm. have to listen to your partner in life and yeah. you, and your kids, like they're part of your, your core thing. Yeah. And you really have to explain to them why you're doing it, what it means and make sure they're on board because if they're not on board, it's not going to work. And then you have a choice to make. Like if they are fundamentally opposed to, they don't want the stress, they don't want the risk. They don't want, you know, those things are going to ruin that relationship. They are, those are just waiting to go off. They're, they're, they're bombs waiting, ticking time bombs. Like they're going to go off. So you have a choice then. Am I going to sacrifice this or am I going to take a different path in life? And Mm -hmm. not everybody needs to be an entrepreneur. So you just, uh, the way you mitigate it though, is making sure everybody's on board and everybody commits. Not that you force them to commit, that they want to commit. They buy into the dream. They have the same mental ownership that your team does because they are your team. Your family is your team and you all have to buy into this. Yeah. I I feel like we're having a one-on-one session right now. (laughs) (laughs) Those are the best. <laughs> I'm hoping that my family outside can hear this and they'll definitely <laughs> listen to this podcast for sure. Um, Just tell them to talk to me. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's, re- that's really cool because there, there was something there that really uh, struck a chord with me, which is around making time. Uh, and I have yeah, told yeah. this story before. <clears throat> Over a decade ago when I was traveling into Asia every second week and my, my son who's now 14 was three and he was getting anxiety around dad traveling all the time. Yeah, and it was interesting. Uh, Uber did actively play a role in lowering his level of anxiety because when he could see the car and track it to the house, he'd mentally process, hey, Dad, the car's here. Dad, the car's here. And by the time the car got there, he goes, Dad, have a great trip. That is great. Yeah, yeah. it was, Small it was things. really cool. It didn't yeah. resolve. I actually got off the plane because my priority is, is my family number one, and I made that conscious decision. But the other thing I'm really excited about, we're actually putting that whole concept into our technology because when you talk around how do we you know, work and execute easily inside tech today, that as you rightfully said, there's so many pieces of tech being thrown at people, right? Yes. How do we make sense of it all? Well, with that one digital workspace is fine, but we're bringing the personalization to it. And we want to ensure that people now have the choice mm-hmm. to know what they're doing. I call it transparency with context, have an idea of what they're doing and make sure they're not doing things they don't need to, but they've also got the time to do things they want. And in one view, they can see both. That's really Balance. important. Yeah. Yes. And, and so that's been a big uh, driver for, uh, for ours for a while that's been you know, sort of festering for a while yeah. that now we're putting into technology that everyone can have that view of what's important and how do we all go on the common journey, whether it's personal, whether it's professional or whether it's futuristic. It doesn't have to be you know, what's in front of you right now. So, mm-hmm. so Steve, with that, I... I um, I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. As I said, you and I could talk about for five hours, and I and I and I, I don't know. I hope I hope the audience sort of listened to this the way that I did. You're talking to me, uh, and you're sharing. You know, you're you're giving me an in, insight to a lot of my feelings, right? and a lot of you know what I've experienced in the past, but what I'm also going to experience in the future, mm-hmm. which, is, which is very very cool. So so with my, with that, mate, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Thank and I, you. Really, I really look forward to continue a relationship with you and having you on the show again. Thank you. And if your audience wants to reach me, I'm super easy to find. So just go to founderspace.com, founderspace.com. You can contact me there. I have tons of videos, tons of like a startup kit for entrepreneurs, all this stuff. And I'm also on almost every social network. You know, LinkedIn is a great one. Just search for Captain Hoff. Captain Hoff, Hoffman, the handle. Yeah, and Founders Space. <laughs> And if you're a gamer, connect with Captain Hoff. Is, is there a, a particular game? I made a bunch of games. My early startup, my first startup was a game company. So yeah. the first startup teaches people, actually, it's ironic, but my first game teaches people how to become entrepreneurs. Yeah, right. It is called Gazillionaire. So yeah. just go to gazillionaire.com and you can download and play that game. It's still no around. Way. It's like it's my, my life. universities and schools <laughs> all over the world. That is fantastic. My 11-year-old did an entrepreneurial course last summer. 
your 11 year old should be playing this game. Yeah, I love Honestly, that. I will get yeah. you a free copy if you want it. You just That's tell me. That's very cool. Yeah, well, thank you very much, mate. We really appreciate it. And uh, sharing your level of knowledge and expertise has just been a wonder. Thank you. Take care. Perfect, mate. Okay, we did it. <laughs> Knocked it out of the ballpark. Well done. Let me just. Uh... Good questions. Really?